Hello, H Civil War subscribers, and welcome back to another episode of the Civil War Era and Digital Humanities interview series. I'm your host, Chase McCarter, PhD student in history at the University of New Mexico and resource editor for H Civil War. Joining me in this episode are Drs. Judith Giesberg and Signe Peterson Formey to talk about their digital project, Last Seen, Finding Family After Slavery. Dr. Judith Giesberg holds the Robert M. Birmingham Chair in the Humanities and is a professor of history at Villanova University. She is also the author of several books, including Civil War Sisterhood, The United States Sanitary Commission and Women's Politics in Transition, published in 2000, Army at Home, Women in the Civil War on the Northern Home Front, published in 2009, Emily Davis's Civil War, the Diaries of a Free Black Woman in Philadelphia, 1863 to 1865, published in 2014, and most recently, Sex and the Civil War, Soldiers, Pornography, and the Making of Modern Morality, published in 2017. Dr. Giesberg also serves as the director of the Last Scene Digital Project and is the founder and director of the Rooted Project, which is working to research and tell a history of Villanova University informed by today's movements towards racial and economic justice. In addition to this, Dr. Giesberg lectures widely to audiences of genealogists, teachers, and interested members of the public at libraries, schools, museums, and churches. My other guest today in this episode, Dr. Signe Peterson Formey, is the Director of Research and Analysis for Last Seen. Dr. Formey recently completed her PhD in History at the University of Texas at Austin in 2020. She also holds a JD from the University of Houston Law Center. Dr. Formey's research focuses on slavery, motherhood, resistance, and the law. In addition to her role at Last Seen, she teaches at UT Austin and is working on her first manuscript entitled, For Esther Has Had a Child and Destroyed It, Enslaved Motherhood, Infanticide, and the Law. As a certified educator in Texas for history grades six through 12, Dr. Formey brings extensive teaching experience and curriculum development expertise to the Last Seen project. So their digital project, Last Seen, Finding Family After Slavery is a collection of information wanted ads taken out by formerly enslaved people looking for family members lost to the domestic slave trade. This project was featured in, among other media outlets, The New York Times, Washington Post, CBS Evening News, and NPR's All Things Considered. Because of last seen, these ads now appear in museum programming in New Orleans, Chicago, Philadelphia, and in Henry Louis Gates' series on Reconstruction and Professor Gates called the collection, quote, a wonder, end quote. The collection was also featured in the December 2018 issue of Junior Scholastic, which is used in over 250,000 classrooms throughout the country. And as of July 2020, the website informationwanted.org had been accessed more than 4 million times. So without further delay, here is our conversation. I hope you all enjoy. Alrighty, Dr. Giesberg, Dr. Formey, thank you so much for taking some time today to, to join H Civil War and talk about your digital project, Last Seen, uh, Finding Families After Slavery. Thank you, Chase, it's great to be here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I just kinda wanna start off with um, some basic background uh, about the project. I'm always interested in how these projects get started and how people get involved. Um, so yeah, so just, I just kind of right off the bat, you know, what's the origins of this project and then how did both of you come to get involved in this? So this project began as a collaboration between uh, Villanova, um, uh, the Department of History at Villanova and uh, Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia. Um, the first several hundred advertisements that we collected on the site uh, all derived from the Christian Recorder, which is uh, a black newspaper published by Mother Bethel starting in uh, the mid 19th century and continued to, it, it continues to be published by Mother Bethel today. So that newspaper is a newspaper that I've used quite a lot in my research on Civil War era Philadelphia. These advertisements had always struck me as um, something of great value to genealogists and to historians and something that I uh, thought might be even more useful and accessible if they were all collected on one site that could easily be searchable. So um, in 2017 or so, we, uh, I worked with Mother Bethel to begin to, um, they lent us the Christian Recorder 
on microfilm so that we could start to uh, collect um, the ads. We thought maybe we would find maybe, um, you know, a few hundred of the ads. If we were super lucky, we might get to maybe, um, you know, five or 600 of these ads. That was back in 2017. Um, when we exceeded that number, um, I applied for um, some uh, grant funding uh, from the National Archives, the National Historic uh, uh, Publication and Records Commission. And uh, we were super lucky to land that funding. Uh, and with that funding, um, I was able to uh, recruit Sydney for me to come work uh, with me on the project. Um, and then I'll, I'll let Sydney take it from, from here. Yeah, so I actually found um, the job posting through the information wanted.org's Twitter feed. And so I was, you know, doing as one does, searching through Twitter just kind of randomly and came across it. And I was like, oh my gosh, what a wonderful project. And, you know, they wanted to produce educational materials and just do more research. And so I applied and here I am. <laughs> so I guess to get into the project itself now, um, I'm curious, you know, what is, what's the scope of the project? And um, I guess for, for people who are interested in using it as a research uh, tool, kind of what kind of information can they gather from, from these ads about, you know, uh, the experience of black people during slavery and, and during emancipation? Yeah, well, um, we now have um, more than 3,500 of these advertisements uh, that were taken out. Um, they began to be taken out during the Civil War as enslaved people became free, um, uh, either um, you know through the uh, you know emancipation work of the of the um, Union Army, or uh, they ran away themselves and became free. And, and, and when they got to the newspapers, they began taking out advertisements. Each one of these is quite short, um, uh, but they all advertise uh, and, and describe a family that was made in slavery. So they give uh, a lot of detail about families um, putting names together uh, in places and in time and the crucial little uh, bit of information here is that all of this data puts these families together, um, you know, beyond the 1870 census wall, which is for uh, many uh, descendants of enslaved uh, Americans can be, you know, really hard to scale that wall because you don't, can't find them in federal records. Um, you can't find enslaved people in federal records if they're, you know, um, only counted as hash marks. So uh, these, each of these ads then names people in a, it, together in a family uh, at a time before, um, you know, enslaved people were free and enumerated as individuals. So I would, I would just like to add for me, the information that is important, I think, along with what Judy said is, that these ads demonstrate and they document the scope and the breadth of the domestic or internal slave trade. And so what you see in a lot of these ads are multiple reloc multiple forced relocations, multiple forced migrations within the larger migration of enslaved people from the upper south to the lower south. And I think it, it documents a history that we need to record and to publish. And I think it's critical to, under, to our understanding of how we see this point in time. Yeah, and I think the, one of the, the things that kind of struck me as I kind of read through some of these ads was the multiple relocations. And it, and it kind of reminds me of this idea that, right, that there are second and third passages once um, enslaved people arrive to the Americas. And so I, with that, it just, that the multiple relocations um, was striking to me about these ads. And then also one of the other things was you kind of see some of these, um, I guess what I've, what I've heard called first acts of freedom or emancipation, people changing their names. And so the, to me, those two things kind of, they present almost seems like a wall of just 
almost insurmountable obstacles uh, for people to kind of reunite with loved ones. And so I know there's an exhibit on the page that actually shows stories of people uh, finding loved ones and reuniting families. But do, do we have a sense of just, you know, what, you know, statistically or something else of just how often people did reunite with loved ones and um, through these ads, how successful they were in doing that? So currently, I think we have 91 successful um, reunifications or reunions that we have recorded on the website. But I think um, part of the larger problem with trying to quantify that is that people might have placed an ad and then found a loved one and then never placed an update. Or we simply haven't found the update yet. So I think it's really difficult to, to give a number to that. Yeah. Right, we always want, um, and, and Signe and I both have used these advertisements in our classes. Um, I, I assign my undergrads um, this uh, collection every year and have them research one of these families. And they're always convinced that they're gonna find a family that got reunified. It's a very, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a strong sort of human need to, right, have this um, separation and in a, you know, in a happy ending or at least have some sort of conclusion. Um, but like as Sydney said, um, we, we just don't know unless they took out a follow-up ad and said, I found my family member. Sometimes they did take a follow-up ad um, and said they found somebody and in the same advertisement, they would still be looking for somebody else. So the thing that really strikes you more than anything when you look at this collection is just how long people continue to hold out hope that they would find their family members. And that's um, one of the most extraordinary things about these advertisements. Up until the early 20th century, people are still taking out advertisements, hoping to find somebody that they were separated from through the domestic slave trade. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it, it really strikes you as you, you know, as you enter into the 20th century, how long these searches go on. One of the, I think one of the especially um, significant parts of this is that sometimes we'll find ads who they'll reference uh, another person's successful search that motivated them or prompted them to then place their own ad. So it might not even be an ad that we have, but they'll allude to, you know, my brother found somebody or my friend found somebody or I was able to find my mother and now I'm looking for my sister or something and I think so there's an untold number of maybe other possible success success stories that we just don't have the match for yet or maybe ever we'll have the match for. <laughs> to your point about I'm sorry about the delay it's um I <laughs> Clearly, I'll wait a few more seconds before. <laughs> um, to your question, Chase, about the names, uh, the name changing, uh, this is, um, right, this is, like you said, this is, this complicates the search for, you know, not only the contemporary search for one another that is, is documented in these advertisements, family members searching for other family members, of course, is, is, is complicated by um, you know, that, that moment at which enslaved people often chose to, to rename themselves as an act of freedom. Um, it, it also, what, what these advertisements do for us is actually show us some of that process, right? They'll say, as you probably noted, Chase, they'll say, you know, my name used to be, or I used to be called this. And, and so we actually have the opportunity to, to, in their own voices, hear formerly enslaved people talk about that process. Of, of renaming themselves, um, uh, but it, it, like you said, it does make it it does make it more complicated for their descendants to find them. What is good about the um, collection is that you at least you can key you know you can keyword search under many of these names, and we encourage people who do that you know who do come to searches to search by the you know by lots of different spellings. Uh, by locations, uh, by the names of enslavers, hopefully to make, you know, to, to, to give you a little bit more of an edge if it is that trying to find somebody who's, who's uh, undergone several name changes. And I, I want to briefly uh, bring, bring back up a point, Dr. Giesberg, that you mentioned, but in addition uh, to this website being a, you know, a resource for researchers, 
it's it's also been of great value to just you know everyday people who are interested in their history and trying to trace their ancestry and you know um you know like you said uh kind of um reform those connections that were, were severed right and i noticed that there there's a, a place on the website where you had where you've gotten feedback from people who have found use in the website in this way yes yes we uh, we have heard um, from uh, uh, more from uh, we don't hear we, we know scholars are are using the site, but who we hear from regularly are genealogists who leave comments on our comment uh, with our comment link to say that they have found somebody or to offer um, you know or to offer advice about where we can find more information about the advertisements or the people named in it. Uh, and, and one of the things that we will, will, we're working on in our redesign is making that whole process easier. Uh, but people are, are very eager to, to post their family trees on, you know, on the site or to, or to use the ads and post the ads on their ancestry, right, um, you know, family trees. And, and so we know, we know people are, are, are finding um, their ancestors on the site. And with the redesign, we hope to make that we, we hope to make the site a collaborative space for genealogists to share that, um, you know, those moments when they find each other and share advice uh, for, for using the collection uh, to fill in those, those uh, holes on, on family trees. I want to just add one thing to Chase, which I, I, I found very interesting. Um, and Signe and I have been talking about this. It's not just descendants of, um, uh, of, of, um, enslaved people who uh, leave comments on the site. We actually periodically get um, inquiries from uh, the descendants of uh, enslavers who, or slave traders um, who have found the project and come to, the, come to us wanting to do something to put it in the, you know, put it in words that they, that they use when they reach us um, because they, they feel as if, you know, this is something they want to make amends for. And they come to us and, and ask us for either for advice about what they can do, or um, more likely they have found letters or other documents um, about their family's connections to slavery. And, and they want some direction from us about what they should do with these uh, materials. Um, so it, it, is a, it is something that we didn't expect, um, but it is a phenomenon that, that we're finding. Um, it, you know, people are, are uh, coming to us also with those kinds of stories as well. Uh, Dr. Forman, did you want to add to that at all? Um, you know, I think Judy said it really well. And I think that's one of the values for what this site presents, because I think whether or not you're doing kind of official research into your family or, you know, you come across it and, and you find these ads and, and you find an unexpected connection. Right. And I, th I think there's, I am constantly surprised by the connections that people are making. So uh, just to get into kind of the nuts, the nuts and bolts of the website, um, Dr. Giesberg, you mentioned this a little bit already, but there's a couple different ways that uh, people can search uh, the database. Um, there's kind of, you know, when you get on the home page, there's kind of the traditional search bar. But um, I guess if we could just talk a little bit about kind of some of those uh, other ways that people can search. You mentioned newspapers names, but there's also an interactive map. So I was wondering if we could talk just a little bit about that map and kind of what it um, what it shows users. And 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 I mean, I mean, the most striking thing is how widespread and how far these uh, ads circulated almost, you know, across the entire country. So I think the map that we currently have, I think it shows something like 1700 ads. So given the scope of what our, our database is now, I mean, it, it's more than doubled. And so one of the things that we're going to do with the updated version of the map is include all of the ads. And I think you're going to be, if you're surprised by what this version of the map shows, I think you're going to be shocked at the depth of what the new map is going to show because our current research focus is on the Midwest and West. And so we're looking at newspapers currently now in, in places like Kansas and Minnesota and, and trying to fill in some of these gaps because 
the migration process that we're seeing, I mean, it, it extends not only to the, the deep south and the old southwest, but it extends all the way to California. And we're even seeing and documenting ads that are placed in Liberia and other places in the Caribbean. And so not only do, does it document kind of the south and westward expansion or migration, it documents, you know, the transatlantic aspects of, you know, people trying, people moving and then looking for connections. Um, so the different ways that you can search the database using the map, you know, when you scroll over one of the um, one of the pinpoints or one of the markers, it'll it'll give you, you know, it'll pull up the name of the person searching. It'll give you a brief summary and, and it gives you an approximate location of where they're searching from and where they are conducting the search. So it kind of connects these two different locations through the ad because what we're seeing is a lot of times the people that are placing the ads you know might have been relocated to texas and they're searching for family that they left behind in virginia so it, it does it does a, i think a significant job of kind of mapping that that migration path dr giesberg would you like to add to that Yes, that um, the, we're uh, particularly excited about having an automatically updated map now um, because this, uh, as Sydney said, this was, um, we, we did this early on in the project just to get a sense of where, you know, where our ads were being placed. Right now, they're all, uh, when, you, when you scroll over, as Sydney said, you get that pinpoint and that's where the searcher is. So they're mapped right now by the searcher. Um, and then, and then as you, as you open up the, you know, as, as the, as the dot opens up, you get, you get all the other geographical data, uh, you know, about sort of where they're, you know, where the people they're searching for are, um, and, and even where they used to live. Uh, but none of that is, is mapped when in our, in our new redesign now, each map, excuse me, each ad is going to have its own distinct map, uh, which is going to lo it's going to locate, uh, all of the different places, uh, listed in the advertisement. So it'll have even, you know, it'll give us greater depth to the geographical data that we have. And I think it'll give us opportunities, as Sydney said, really to sort of dig in and to think about these, you know, multiple dislocations or multiple migrations uh, in a way uh, that, uh, that we haven't had the opportunity uh, to do before. Um. So in addition to kind of this map and um, some of the other exhibits that I've mentioned before, there's also a tab for teaching on this. And so I'm just, I'm interested in how this website has been translated into curriculum, not just for higher education, as you mentioned, Dr. Giesberg, you use, in your, you use this in your classrooms, but also in uh, K through 12 education. So that is also a focus of the kind of um, redesign of the website. We, we're looking to expand our offerings. Currently, we have several lesson plans that are kind of categorized based on an approximate age range that we feel like they're appropriate for. So, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, post-secondary. Um, and I think one of the ways that we're going to expand this is to, one, not only add more content, but also kind of seek more participation from educators so that they can share with us how they're using these lesson plans and these ads in their classrooms and create a kind of a, um, a really, I guess for lack of a better word, a vibrant space for them to not only engage with our materials, but engage with each other. So we're looking at expanding our offerings and yeah, I don't know, Judy. What what would you add to that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like yeah, as you said, right. Create the space similar to what we are aspiring to do with genealogists to create a space where teachers are sharing tips about how they're, like Sydney said, sharing tips about how they use the site in their classroom, uploading their own, um, you know, curriculum curricular materials. Um, to so we can find out more about right. So they can find so we can find out more, but they, but more importantly, they can find out more about. How they're uh, how they're using the site. We did beta test a little bit. A few of our uh, the the current um, if for folks who are interested in looking at the site now and not and not waiting necessarily for a few more months for the for the new site the redesign to go up. We do as Sydney said 
have um, a few lesson plans, which we tried out uh, just here locally near Villanova. We uh, graduate students tried them in some classrooms. Um, so there is, there, there, there are, um, and there's some testimonials there about how teachers used the site, um, excuse me, used the, the ads in their classroom to, to have students think through what it would be like to search for somebody in the age before, you know, sort of on the cusp of, I guess we would say cusp of mass communication, right? What it means to sort of have access to the newspaper for the first time, what it would mean for people to be searching for people who are not necessarily always able to read or don't have access to the printed word. So there are, um, there's, uh, there's, there are lesson plans in there that talk about sort of, you know, uh, what it would mean to sort of pass this information around via churches, because a lot of the ads, as you probably noted, Chase, say in there for uh, preachers to, to, um, to announce these searches in their churches. Um, so, right, so that sort of allows students to sort of think about what that would be like to pass along this information by via word of mouth. And, and, and that'll help students also think about just sort of the extent of the grapevine telegraph, how, right, that, that, that continues, you know, to, that, that sort of in those informal formal networks of communication continue beyond the end of slavery and, you know, and, and formally enslaved people use them to hopefully to, to find one another. I, I think another, and kind of building on that, I think another um, benefit of these ads for teachers from the teaching standpoint is that so many of the ads are, are so concise that they present a really good way to bring primary sources into the classroom. They're really approachable. They're really, you know, easily digestible by students at multiple grade levels. And so it, it gives the teacher a platform or a way to introduce how to talk about not only talk about slavery, but talk about family, enslaved family, you know, talk about the internal slave trade, to talk about some of these really different difficult topics, but to also talk about, you know, the, the consequences or the ramif long-term ramifications of, it, of slavery. And because some of the ads are, they're, some of the ads are very short and some of the ads are much more detailed and we have a few very long ads. So really you can use them regardless of what grade you're teaching. There's something there that students can, can have access to and teachers can you know, inter, inter, in, introduce primary sources or find a way to kind of expand on how they're using primary sources in the classroom, which is a big curricular push in many, you know, in many states. Yeah, and I think that's, that's another thing that strikes me about this, um about this website and it, this is something I was listening to a conversation between Peter Carmichael and Stephen Barry a couple weeks ago about digital humanities and the the teaching tab seems kind of to fall on that element of you know meeting meeting the public where they're at so you know you know at, at every grade level having something so that so that students at a very young age even can be introduced to as you mentioned Dr. Formey and Dr. Kiesberg these very difficult topics of slavery and separation and, and kind of this darker history that I think right now we're, you know, given contemporary events, you know, kind of realizing that we need to introduce these topics early and often, right? Um, so I, I guess kind of going along with this here, um, there are, other than the the, the, the teaching resources of the tab, the, this uh, project has also kind of inspired, um, I guess for lack of a better word, some other projects, right? And so the, um, I absolutely loved the um, collaboration that the both of you did with um, the theater department at Villanova for the, um, let's see, it's called Last Scene, um, let's see, Voices from, uh, Voices from Slavery's Lost Families Performances. So I was wondering if you, if both of you could briefly just talk about how that collaboration came about and just about that, uh, those performances for people who might be interested in, in checking that out through the through the page. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I I um, I would encourage anybody who's uh, who's listening to log on and and watch that performance. Um, it's it, it is incredibly moving. Um, that um, and and that and, and and full credit for that goes to uh, Professor Valerie Joyce, who is chair of theater department at Villanova University, and a brilliant. Um, you know, uh, sort of producer and um, creative mind. Um, 
uh, so when I, I just, uh, I, I just went along for the ride. I would say I, I, um, talked to, uh, Valerie, um, the summer before we did that in February of 2019. So it would have been the summer of 2018. I, uh, just popped into her office and said, you know, and, and Valerie's written plays about 19th century, um, uh, black women, both free and enslaved. So I, I knew she, you know, I didn't have to, I didn't have to sell this very hard and just talk to her about like, what would this look like? And she, um, uh, and, and she ran with it. And, and, and what, um, and, uh, what we did was it put out a call to, uh, anybody, uh, in the region because they were going to have to come into Villanova to actually meet with, uh, Valerie to, um, to figure out how they were going to read it and how they were going to sort of, you know, make sense of the ad, um, and, and sort of, and, and you know, per, and on, a, on a very deeply personal level. So we put out this call and, um, and asked people to choose three ads uh, that spoke to them on some level. And, uh, and then they had two rehearsals uh, at Villanova and, and then we had this performance which she, you know, which she choreographed and, and put the original, hired somebody to do the original music. Um, the most extraordinary thing ever was uh, the, uh, uh, the Saturday before, or maybe two Saturdays before, when everybody came, uh, and we had uh, like more than I don't know seventy something actors from the age ages youngest was seven um, to the oldest war was um, it was in their seventies I, I believe, um, and they came from as far away as uh, as Baltimore. We had people from Baltimore um, coming up to Philadelphia just for this. Um, and they came up for the Saturday um, um, sort of rehearsal and, um, and, and I just walked around and talked to them about why they were there and how they chose their ads. And it was, like you said, Chase, you really get a sense of how many sort of modern, um, you know, situations, people feel that sort of reverberation of this kind of, you know, they, they feel that connection to, to, to these people because of their own experiences with family separation. So we had uh, a young man there who talked about um, uh, his children who he was separated from um, and, 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 you know, and, and so he chose an ad for a father who was looking for their children. Um, we had people there who were outraged at um, the family separation policy as it was unfolding on the border and, and came to this project because they really felt like we need to know more about this history. And, and we, you know, so for them, it was more, it was less, maybe less personal, but more sort of political that they be believe that we need to, you know, we need to make more of this history so that we can stop doing this. Um, and then we just, you know, we just had people who, um, uh, who came to the project because they had been using it for genealogical research and that hadn't necessarily found anybody, but found somebody who lived in their hometown, in the hometown of somebody they were looking for. So they chose that ad. Uh, so we had all sorts of different, you know, um, kinds of personal connections to these ads and to these stories. Um, and, and I think it comes through when you see the performance, how people feel, you know, how the ads may make people feel. And importantly, as we said, right, these ads were supposed to be read out loud. Um, and so um, hearing them is very different from reading them quietly at your laptop. Uh, and, and so being in that theater, being in that space and hearing these different voices, reading the ads, young, old, everything in between is, um, is really, you know, really, really quite moving. And you really get a sense of just how you know, many generations of, of you know, descendants um, really sort of share this experience of, of separation and the long-term consequences of it. So the production was before my time at Last Scene, but one of the ways that I hope to use this, these extremely moving um, readings is that we are talking about, to go back to education a little bit, we're talking about making these into smaller, uh, into smaller clips that teachers can play in their classroom and integrating and designing lessons using these clips. So you can watch the entire performance and then we're gonna create some educational materials around 
them to kind of, again, give voice to these separations, give voice to, um, you know, to make it more relatable to, you know, on a more personal level. It's, it's different, like Judy said, it's different hearing it and seeing it kind of reenacted than it is to just, you know, have kind of a paralyzed interaction between a screen. To, so I think it's going to be, I think the legacy of this production is going to be, we're going to try to build on it and expand on it. And I think it's going to be really something special. Yeah, I, I, the phrase that came to mind is always watching uh, the performances. Kind of, you feel like you kind of get hit with an emotional sledgehammer. I mean, the 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 ads are very emotional themselves, but just seeing, um, and the performers are quite good, and so you get. I mean, you really see that emotion, and you can, you know, in almost in a way, almost feel you know the sadness and the pain that people experienced. You know, as they're trying to search for people they may not have seen. I mean, I think one ad said, and I'm sure this is pretty common that, you know, they had been separated from a family member for 18 years. I mean, it's just, um, it's unbelievable. Um, and, and some, of the, some of the ads, you know, I think it gives even more weight to see some of the ads read by children and teens, right. yeah. because I think that really kind of brings home and, and you can bring those into the classroom in different ways or the parent searching for, uh, you know, children that they last saw when they were 12 or 13. I think it's just, it's a different way of kind of thinking about the embodiment of what these ads represent. Yeah, I think it's also, it's a, a fantastic way to get students, if it's even possible, to kind of empathize and to, and if they can place themselves even a toe in the shoes of these people, just to try to understand and get a, get a sense of how destructive so slavery was on people's lives. Um, so in addition to the performances, I wanna just briefly talk about this because it's, it's, it's really amazing stuff, but there was a youth art competition that is uh, in conjunction with these ads. So I'm interested just to talk about uh, how that uh, got started as well. Again, I'm going to give somebody, I'm going to give credit where it belongs. Uh, so the youth um, art uh, competition uh, was the uh, brainchild of a graduate student who uh, was at Villanova and, and um, graduated last May. And her name is uh, Katarina Anderson. She is now gone back to uh, New Hampshire, where is where she's from, and she's teaching in the middle school. Um, and uh, she came to our program and, um, and I was really lucky. She was assigned to me as a graduate student. And uh, when I was in the midst of talking to Valerie about this performance and, um, and, and Katie just said, can I do this? And I said, sure, you know, do whatever you want, right? I, I didn't understand what any of it meant, but she ran with it and she put a call out to schools and, and asked students to choose an ad and, and to use that ad as inspiration for, um, you know, to create something with it. Um, and it was amazing what students did uh, with those ads. Again, I think this gets back to a point that you were making, Chase, just now, and, and Signe was that the ads communicate so many, at so many different levels. They, you, know, you know, we can use them to sort of teach the nuts and bolts of how historians work. Uh, but students are going to approach them um, in, in, in so many unpredictable ways. Um, the person who won the art competition, you can see on the site, um, connected, and he was a high school student, he connected, we had entries from middle school um, uh, through high school. Uh, he connected the um, ads to the legacy of mass incarceration. And, um, and, and you can see he, he created um, a picture of a, a silhouette and, and, and right, and, and, and the ads are, are, um, are bars, uh, right? So sort, sort of thinking about America's, you know, um, you know the, the, the racism that informed the separation of families and the ways in which, uh, and he said this in his reflection, just the ways in which um, the assumptions were that, you know, that the connections between uh, family members in, within a black family we were not the same as a, in a white family. So you could break them up and there would be no consequences to it. And just sort of thinking about the separations that occur uh, when, um, you know, black mothers or fathers are incarcerated today and, and the ways in which they lose track, they can lose track of, of, uh, of their children um, who sometimes are, are put in foster care and, right. So, so this student thought about, you know, this, the, 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 the 
call simply said, choose an ad and create something with it. Uh, and this, this student did, you know, um, created this really extraordinary uh, work of art that spoke to how thoughtful our students are, um, right? This student had obviously learned the lessons of empathy uh, and really in, in sort of, you know, social responsibility, um, good parenting, good teaching, um, and, and use the ads in, in, in a way to um, express those things that he was thinking. Um, yeah, they're great. And we also, we had people who did sculptures uh, with the, uh, you know, based on the ads, um, you know, right, poetry, we had it, just, you know, everything. And, and it was all, like I said, um, you know, the brilliance of, of Katie Anderson, who, uh, who, who pulled it all off. All right, so as we kind of wrap up our conversation here, um, we've already discussed a little bit, but I'm just interested, you know, you mentioned that the, the, the site's in the middle of a redesign, but just so people know, kind of what is on the horizon for Last Scene? What are the additions that uh, you all hope to make in the, in the future? So I think one of the one of the things that I'm personally more most excited about is we're we've started a um, social media campaign, and so we have started a um, kind of hashtag on this day, and we have mapped out or planned out. So like on September 1st, we go we have found an ad that was placed originally on September 1st, and so we're using that as a way to kind of create these connections across space and time. And so one of the things that we're doing with the new website is we are creating a, an automatically updated kind of sidebar that's connected to our Twitter feed. And so you can simultaneously see the tweets and hopefully we'll expand um, not only traffic to our Twitter page and the other social media aspects, but you know, kind of cre demonstrate to people the, the ways that we are really reaching out to various groups, you know, whether it be the public or genealogists or educators and, and really kind of having them see that the relevance of what we're doing. And, you know, and I think that's what, that's my personal favorite part of the redesign so far, but I think just the ways that we are streamlining the website, making it more engaging and more readily accessible on multiple levels. So whether you're a genealogist, you know, looking at the map or searching through our database that we're producing of African American in scope newspapers, so that you can kind of see the depth of what we're drawing from and, and the depth of the sources that we're looking at. And I think those are really exciting things for me as I think about um, kind of the responsibility that we are we are assuming in putting these ads out there and, and just being really open and um, transparent about how we're coming to these ads. And, um, and I would just add to, to uh, what, you know, what Sydney was talking about, about some of the redesign options and some of the redesign features that, uh, that she's excited about. Um, I, I'm really, um, really looking forward to the unveiling of the redesign because it's going to make better use of all the work that's gone into tagging, um, and Sydney's being really um, modest. <laughs> she's not. <laughs> she's not telling you anything about all the work she's done with uh, tagging our collection. So tagging is um, is a really key part of making these thirty five hundred ads discoverable at, at at multiple levels. So uh, we talked about how you can approach ads via the map. Uh, we talked about, obviously, your users uh, will note that you can simply go in and start putting in names and you can find ads. Um, but the tagging is a whole other level of finding these advertisements. Um, and what the tags do is add um, some interpretation into uh, the, this corpus, this collection. Uh, so the tags will say things like, so, you know, you, somebody will look for their son who enlisted in the United States Colored Troops, but they don't ever say that. They just say, my son, um, you know, went with the Union Army or, or you know, or, um, you know, served in the something theater or something. So they're, they're using different, they're using whatever language makes sense to them. And that, that's, you know, that, that, that works on some level. But, uh, but as scholars, we, we are applying other labels to it. So we're thinking, we're thinking in terms of, oh, that's the US colored troops, right? And 
And is there a way by adding that tag to that ad, we can help people who are coming to the site and are not necessarily going to search for, you know, uh, served in the peninsula campaign or, you know, or, or, uh, well, that's a little too early, but right. You know, but you know, that, that, uh, enlisted with the U S colored troops, or they're not using those, they're not using those terms, but they're clearly referring to that phenomenon. So by adding that tag, what we're doing is, is, is allowing those people to find it. So you can search by tag and, 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 um, because we've had multiple generations of simply my graduate students who get assigned to me, I say, okay, great, you're going to work on this. And, and so they've been tagging it. And, but what signy has been doing uh, is really the hard work of going through and making these tags consistent. Um, and, and also adding definitions of these tags. So, right, so, so that will allow people to sort of come in and say, well, I'm interested in finding, you know, anybody who um, changed their name, right? Um, right, so you can go in and you can, you can search by that tag, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Absolutely. You know, so, right, so, uh, so that, that, that's there already. But with the redesign, it'll be much easier to search by tag. I'll stop because Sydney has probably a lot more to say about the tags. <laughs> She's been doing all this hard work. I think like what Judy said is when you come to these ads, you want kind of a consistent way to come across the information. So, you know, whether it's left with the Union Army, we do have references to enslaved people that, you know, they'll, they'll say, you know, left followed Sherman's troops or, um, you know, left with the Union Army. And so we're trying to make this kind of a consistent way to kind of, you know, conduct research, but also kind of look for patterns or kind of look for, you know, people who are looking for parents. So, you know, if you're interested in maybe writing a paper or doing research or creating a lesson plan of somebody who's looking for a parent, you know, that's a tag that we're applying to these ads. So kind of thinking about approaching the ads from multiple ways and kind of a way to kind of create a way to access what's implied in the ad or kind of like the information that's missing and to kind of create that bridge so that, you know, whether it's left with the Union Army or changed name or, you know, um, the AME church, you know, just kind of seeing some of the different ways that we're pulling information from these ads and then making them accessible. And, and now when you go to, if you, when you, uh, another, and we'll probably stop talking about all this, but it's very exciting. Uh, now when you find an ad, like when you, uh, when a cert, when a user finds an ad that they want to use, they'll land on that page and we'll give them suggestions for the way that ad is connected via tag to other ads, right? So, so that'll also what we hope. Uh, well, we have, we have, we, we're, we're, we've been very lucky that, that the, the, the um, uh, collection is well trafficked. What we'd like to do is, is encourage those visitors to linger, um, to, to spend more time exploring the ads and, and, and with the new redesign, um, once you, you know, once you click on one individual ad and you want to dig in, it's automatically going to encourage you to say, you know, click on this tag, find other people. Um, who, you know, said they were kidnapped or something or, you know, or, you know, some other tag that we've applied to it. Um, so, right, so they can see those connections that Sydney, uh, that Sydney was describing. And, and even geographical, like, so if you're looking at Alabama and you want to narrow it to, you know, Montgomery, or you're looking at, you know, some of these places, then it's going to be right there. And you can say, okay, let me see ads that were published in you know, in New Orleans, or let me see ads that are published in Richmond, and it just makes that interaction so much easier. So what you're looking at is our, uh, uh, on the website, we're taking you on a, a tour, and I would just start by saying um, that uh, that you, when you uh, come to the site, and then sometime in the next uh, three or four months, it, there, were, there are going to be some differences, there are going to be some different images, there are going to be some different um, features, uh, but most of the basics that you're going to see today uh, will still be there. Uh, so when you land on the site, you um, can see, as you can see, there are, um, we uh, direct users to choose uh, uh, a few options just right from the very beginning. 
uh, if you're eager to start your research, you can simply go to the search bar right here and start typing in the names of uh, a family member uh, that you might want to look up. So uh, maybe we could look up, um, see if we find anybody uh, with your last name, Chase. Um, and, and lo and behold, we did. Um, So you saw, as you saw, right, we got uh, a list of our results, which we had one. Um, and then um, when you click on it, you are then uh, directed to this landing page, which gives you some basic information. Uh, the title of the ad, as we assigned it, which is, is not really a title of the ad, but more of a just a very short descriptor so that you know, people will know what the ad contains. Uh, for instance, this one uh, is taken out by a man named Shep Rinfro, who was searching for his mother, brothers, and sisters. Uh, you then get um, uh, the image of the ad, which you um, can um, save a JPEG of if you want. Uh, then as you scroll down, you get uh, the metadata. Um, you, uh, we assign it based on what it, the newspaper called it, uh, a lot of the ads. Um, are, are simply labeled information wanted ads, but sometimes they're also appearing in newspapers under lost friends or dear editor. So you're gonna find that in the subject line. Here you get a brief description of the ad as we've entered it. Um, the newspaper uh, is listed under source, the date, under coverage. We are entering in basic geographical data that we find in the ad to make the mapping process easier. Uh, then you find our contributor, uh, one of our awesome graduate students who um, has been, you know, going through the uh, microfilm to find these advertisements. Um, and as your users uh, surely know, this is a crowdsourced um, transcription process, uh, pro uh, project. So we have, uh, so once a new ad is posted to the website, um, you uh, users who have signed up for transcription accounts go in and transcribe it. Uh, and then we double um, check the, we, it goes through a process of, of, of two, a, a, a double process of checking the transcription. It is then uploaded and, and so users who have found a tr an ad such as this one um, will find the transcription. Uh, once an ad is transcribed, all of the data that all, all of the I, I should say very simply right all of the words that are in the ad um, are now you now discoverable through keyword uh, right so you know when while the ad is waiting transcription what users users can find the ad based on our description of it right so we will enter mo we will enter most of the names and and, and locations as we have located the ad and uploaded it. But once we've got a verified transcription of it, all of this is keyword searchable. So you can find the ad, you know, through any of these things that are, anything that's said in the, in the ad. All the transcriptions, of course, are right verbatim. We don't change uh, spellings. Uh, we, we will add, if it's, uh, we will on occasion add in bracket um, the word that has been abbreviated so that, right, so obviously so that, that, you know, users can find the ad based on that word as well, even though it's, it's got a, a, a sort of a contemporary abbreviation um, and, and right, so, but those are all marked clearly with uh, bracketing. Um, and then uh, you, um, as you scroll down, you get a little bit more of the sort of in the weeds kind of uh, metadata. Um, and as I suggested to you, right, you, you have the option to click on uh, the ad and get an image of it. Uh, most of them are JPEG. We still do have a few of these that show up as TIFFs, so they're, they're a little bigger. Uh, we're, we try to only save them as JPEGs, but you can, then, um, you can then see, when you click on it, you can then download the TIFF or the JPEG. Uh, but you can also, um, as you go down to that ad, um, sorry, where am I? Just lost myself here. Um, users who are interested in transcribing, and this is one of the things that we're super excited about with the redesign. It's going to be easier to find ads that need transcription, and you won't sort of um, 
sort of, you know, um, have to sort of go through several clicks to find out an ad has already been transcribed. What we're looking at here, on the other hand, is, is the way one would also discover the ad as a transcriber. Um, so you, uh, once you've, you know, you've seen the ad, you then go down here and, and, and um, it, when you have a transcription account, you click on it. It'll give you the image of the ad. And you'll uh, be able to transcribe it here. A user who wants to transcribe would find uh, this option open here. Um, this one's already been transcribed, but if it weren't, if it weren't, you would, um, when you clicked on this, you would just get an empty box where then users will, edit, will enter their transcription. So that is finding what, that is a, a very sort of detailed way that one describes, one discovers an ad that wants to transcribe it. Um, but let's go back to our um, page. I think I have to wait for everything to catch up. Okay, so, right, so, uh, so you can go directly to the search page and begin searching as we just did uh, to find uh, somebody who mentioned uh, the last name McCarter. Um, uh, but you can also go to the site and uh, approach it, oops, sorry, um, approach it uh, via these two choices right here. So our main, you know, sort of our main demographics are the people who we believe are using the site uh, for the most part are educators and researchers, whether they're genealogists or uh, historians uh, or other kinds of scholars who are using the site. So teachers can click on the teach button and be taken to our uh, handy dandy, ready to use uh, um, lesson plans, which are coded based on the levels that we, that, uh, that they um, are appropriate for in the classroom. Um, you can down, you can click on one of these tweeting the past and you can download um, the entire uh, lesson plan there along with um, you know, everything you need to, to begin a lesson um, there. Um, and uh, so, so that's, so, you, so those are K through 12 lesson plans there, as I suggested. Uh, we are working now to develop um, more resources for um, uh, people to use in higher ed. Uh, mostly what we have found is that uh, users in higher ed have come to us interested in having their whole class transcribe the advertisements, which is a great exercise and allows students to be part of the process of, you know, of, of making these things accessible. Well, what we're going to be doing in the redesign is, is, is uh, making it more obvious for uh, the other ways in which you can use this in your college classroom beyond, uh, beyond transcription. So um, we have a couple of these, uh, a couple of those um, ideas here um, for college students or college classrooms to be used in college classrooms. Um, yeah, so you can, you can either scroll down or you can simply go straight to those by clicking those boxes there. Um, and then the other option is to go to research, which again takes you to a search box where you can begin to search by uh, the names of people. Uh, if you click on the little dots here, it gives you a sense of, of some of the ways that you can search. It gives you some, um, uh, some advice. Uh, we're going to be making that advice more robust, um, and we're going to be giving people examples so that they can make the most of the searching that they do. Um, the research page, as we suggested, then also beyond um, simply going straight to the box and starting to search by name. There are three other options uh, currently on uh, the research landing page. Uh, there is, uh, we can take you directly to the map, which I'll do in just a second. Uh, it can, you can also um, find ads by location, as Sydney just said. So just, you know, say you decided you wanted to find all ads that mention a location in Africa, either for a searcher or a searchee. Uh, so you can just click on um, Africa and you can get all the sites, the, all the ads that mention Africa as a location um, and, and then other, you know, other locations listed here, uh, mostly by state. But as, you know, like, like Signe said, we've got ads from 
uh, the Bahamas, we've got ads from Canada, and, but it, in any case, you can then just click on one of these and find all ads that list that location. It, it in some ways sort of uh, condenses what you're seeing in the map. Um, oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, yeah, so, and then the third way that you can discover ads is um, by um, newspaper. So what you're seeing here uh, gives you a sense of the scope of the project so far. So here is a list of all of the newspapers uh, from which we have, uh, you know, currently that we have, we have had, we have found ads in uh, that our collection contains. I'm not going to get the syntax of that sentence right. <laughs> These are all the newspapers where we found ads. Um, and, uh, and you can also just sort of click on any of these and get all of the ads taken out by the Iowa State Bystander, for instance. Uh, and lo and behold, there are uh, a number of those. And again, as Signe said, we're really just now really starting to focus on the Midwest. Uh, so I'm guessing these, these ads are gonna be even more um, robust. You can also find ads simply by clicking on a tag. So here are some of the tags that we feature on this uh, page, but we've got how many tags all together, Sydney? I think 116 so far. So you it's, so it's you down from 401, so we're making progress. <laughs> definitely progress. Definitely progress. It was Chase, it was the wild, wild west of tagging for a while. Students got very excited and were like, oh no, we need to tag that too. And <laughs> So Sydney's been reining all of that in and, and really making it much more, it, it, arguably 400 tags is just unwieldy. It's too many tags. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> it just wouldn't, you know, it, when there's that many, it's not useful to you, to us. So, uh, so here are some of the, the here are just a few of the tags. Like we said, the U.S. Colored Troops is tagged here. Um, we also have the, the tag that you mentioned, Chase. We have an exhibit on ads of people who found each other. Uh, but that only includes a few of them. There are more. So if you clicked on if you clicked on the found tag, you could find more of those kinds of ads. Um, if you clicked on resistance, uh, which I definitely recommend, you'll find all sorts of interesting things that have been tagged resistance. Um, you know, from uh, people who re record having run away on the Underground Railroad, and they actually use that term um, to people who describe self mutilation. Uh, to, you know, um, uh, to um, escapes, you know, just other kinds of escapes or, or, or things like that. So, um, so those have all been tagged resistance. Um, again, that shows you the utility of these tags, right? This is not something that they're using. They're not using that term there, but we as scholars would recognize that term as something of interest to us to find out, you know, what we can learn about resistance from this collection. So, um, right, so those are, so you can find the, via map, location, newspaper, and tag. And then we also have uh, some uh, search um, uh, suggestions down here. And then finally, um, the, um, you can uh, explore the ads via our uh, map, um, which as you can see here is um, a, um, geolocated, uh, uh, about 1,700 of our ads were geolocated um, based on uh, the searcher data. So uh, you know, wherever the searcher said that uh, they were, wherever the searcher is located is where their, um, the dot appears on the map. And we have, an overlay, we have overlaid it this um, contemporary or 19th century map. Um, overlaid so you can actually um, see it scoped out like this and you can get a sense of just how broad this reaches. You've got those international ads showing up there. Um, and then when you, oops, when you uh, drill down and look more, um, you know, closer to ground level, um, you get a sense of, you know, uh, you get a, a, a different sort of way of looking at the ads. And as Signe said, as you scroll over uh, and, and see one of these pinpoints, um, you can then um, see the, it, it then pops up and it gives you the ad and it gives you some of the basic data about the ad. Uh, this ad right here appears not to have yet been transcribed. So 
so there you go. Um, but others of these ads will have a full transcription. Um, so this one um, taken out by Adam Sisson um, of St. Joseph, Missouri. Um, and that's where it's mapped. Uh, but you can sort of, you can see how this works here. Um, and you can kind of scoot around the map and just keep exploring based on sort of where they pop up. So another way to do this is, you know, so you're starting a project on, you know, slavery in Missouri, um, right? So you can come to our collection and just start to explore some of the voices of people who survived slavery in Missouri and see them on a map and, um, and, and see, you know, where they began their searches for their uh, lost family members. Um, yeah, so that is, um, those are um, some of the major features that you'll find on the site. You can also, uh, on the homepage, uh, I skipped right over this, but uh, <laughs> before you get down to the social media uh, links down here, uh, three things I'd point out that, that cycle back to what stuff we were talking about in the interview. Uh, you can go here and see the, all the entries to um, our youth art competition uh, and get inspired. Maybe somebody wants to do something like that in their own schools. Um, uh, so this, is the, the, this shows you our entry, uh, all of our entries and our winners here. Um, this is our exhibit on families that did find one another and took out a follow-up ad, as Signe mentioned. And then finally, uh, if you click on this link right here, you will be taken to the February 2019 performance that Chase talked about. And I would definitely strongly recommend uh, that your users go and listen to uh, this performance to get a sense of what this collection um, means. Finally, um, you can, uh, if you can see on the site that you can, um, beyond the research and the teaching, there are other ways uh, you can get involved. If you go to the Get Involved um, drop-down menu, uh, this is where you can sign up to transcribe. If, if your um, you know, uh, viewers want to get involved as transcribers, they can sign up right here. They can sign up to, if, if you know, they're intrepid and they want to start searching through newspaper databases or uh, check out some microfilm that only their local library has or their university library has. They can certainly get in on that action too and they can contribute ads to the collection. We do get uh, users who do that, um, who, who have contributed their own ads to it. Uh, so they can do that here. And then here, of course, is the um, currently the way we find out all these really interesting things about our users. Um, they're sharing their stories with us. And then finally, I would say uh, it would be great if everybody uh, knew that we have an active social media presence. We encourage everybody listening to follow us on Facebook um, and to follow us on Twitter and Instagram, which we, we have, which is awesome, um, because uh, our amazing graduate students are running a, a really successful uh, social media campaign, as, as Signe said earlier. Uh, running an ad that was um, published that day. Uh, so, so it's a great thing to, to sort of keep up on, um, on, 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 on the collection and, and, and hear these stories, one of these many stories in the collection by following us on Twitter or, or on Facebook. All right, Dr. Formey, Dr. Giesberg, thank you so much for uh, joining H Civil War today and, uh, a fast, and for a fascinating conversation about your uh, digital project last seen. Um, for people who are interested in exploring this website, uh, you can find it at informationwanted.org. And also there will be a link to it under the resource tab and digital humanities on the H Civil War page. Um, so before I let the both of you go, uh, where can people uh, contact you, find you on the web uh, to either follow up with this website or just see you know, what else is going on? Uh, both of us are at Villanova, so you can contact us if you want to shoot us an email, you can certainly um, email me at judith.geesberg at villanova.edu. Uh, I also have my own Twitter account. Um, I can't really figure out Instagram very much. I think I have an Instagram account, but I wouldn't try to contact me through that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but I'm happy to hear what your users thinks, think about the project and how we can make it uh, more useful to them in their own research. 
So you can also contact me at Villanova. I think my email there is sform01 at villanova.edu. And then um, I also have a Twitter account. And I like Judy. Um, do not, I'm not successful with the Instagram. <laughs> Um, but you can also contact me at the University of Texas at Austin. <clears throat> Great. Um, well, thank you so much again to the both of you for joining us today. And um, thank you much to everybody who tuned in and watched. Have a good day.